History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. This is Lecture 9, The Critique of Universal History, December 8th, 1964. Since it is my undoubtedly laudable intention in these lectures to give you not just an introduction to the introduction, but also as much as possible of the relevant subject matter, I have decided to modify my argument a little. I should like, therefore, to confine my comments to giving you a few of what are, in my opinion, the pivotal categories needed for the construction of a theory of history. I shall then move from the concept of history to that of freedom, so that I can discuss the concept of freedom in the second half of the semester. This means that there will be a little less time, and perhaps no time at all, to focus on a number of purely philosophical questions concerning dialectical structure, which I had thought important. But it also means that I shall carry out a little more faithfully the promise that I had made in announcing this course of lectures. One of the countless causes of disappointment experienced in universities stems from the discovery that a lecture course with a highly promising title frequently yields far less in practice than one had been led to believe. If I cannot do away with this problem, I should at least like to show you that I am conscious of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I've had a lot to say about the unity of the historical process, about the idea of the course of history as a totality, and I follow this up with some remarks on what I have called the negativity of the course of the world. I should like now to transfer this, this theme to the construction of history. <clears throat> this idea, this motif, which I have explained to you in philosophical terms, in earlier days people would have said in speculative terms, can be found in Hegel, and indeed in the entire thinking of the Hegelian era, under the rubric of universal history. During the period of the so-called ascendancy of the bourgeoisie, this concept of universal history, by which I mean that of a continuous history of mankind, was generally conceived as an upward development, albeit not without setbacks. This idea formed something like the general climate of thought at the time, and incidentally, you would do well to bear in mind when working on Hegel that what you find in Germany at this period is not so much the achievement of individual writers as the expression of an objective spirit as it developed in the course of living communication. This then found its most coherent expression in Hegel's thought. Under the influence of Dilthey's History of Ideas, we, will, we still see these things in far too individualistic a way. I just say this in passing so as to make you aware of a perspective from which you will perhaps find it easier to gain an understanding of Hegel. The path taken by history as a whole, if we may put it like this, ought in the spirit of Hegel's philosophy to be a thoroughgoing phenomenology of mind. It would not be difficult to read something like a theory of universal history from the phenomenology of spirit, which is what is generally thought of as one of Hegel's systematic works. These ideas are roughly equivalent to the conception of world literature, which was of such great importance at around the same time, as we can see from Goethe. And not only Goethe, since we can see the same thing throughout the Romantic movement, from where it can be traced back to Herder. Hegel may have been at loggerheads with Herder, quite explicitly so, in fact, but their disagreement was mediated, in particular, by the way in which all the romantic motifs migrated into his philosophy and were absorbed there, but were at the same time reflected upon critically. The same may be said of this idea of a to totalizing history that was both coherent and also broken down into its specific phases. It expressed this idea of a total history that was at the same time divided into distinct aspects. We may say that the notion of the joining together of the world was anticipated by the youthful bourgeoisie in this idea of universal history as a unity, as the single unfolding process of human nature, and that it arose at a moment in history when such a unity had not yet become a visible possibility. This idea was given its definitive expression in Wendell Wilkie's formula of one world. We need add only one only that, at the time, the antagonistic elements that determine this universality, this internally divided unity of a global society, 
had not yet become crystallized. Nowadays, this idea of universal history is highly controversial and problematic. However, if what I have said to you about the unity of history in general, about the unfolding of a unified historical process, has any plausibility, there is a lot that can be said in its favour. And it is my belief that, if you wish to say anything at all about the theory of history in general, you must enter into a discussion of the construction of universal history. This idea is under attack from two quarters. It is criticized by positivists who constantly point out that there is no such thing as a unified, continuous process of history, and they have good reason to do so. They point out, for example, that the immense rupture in Western history during the long centuries of the barbarian migrations, followed by the tentative rediscovery of the classical tradition, is the most dramatic illustration of this. But you can trace this element of rupture, this demonstration that it is not possible to speak of a unified progress of history into its most minute ramifications. I need mention only one sphere of activity, one that has just occurred to me and that concerns a branch of knowledge with which I am conversant, namely music. The situation in music is that a particular development, the compromise between medieval polyphony and the newly discovered homophonic music, culminated in Bach. It was then interrupted by non-musical, as it were, exotic factors, namely social developments. The result was that, following Bach's death, a new style emerged that can be regarded as the negation of his music. We then see a musical tradition of quite a different kind, one that incorporates Bach's achievements only tentatively and with difficulty. Incidentally, this demolition of the Bachian tradition after Bach was an event that probably had extremely grave consequences. But it is not my concern here to give you a history of the philosophy of music. At all events, you can see here how a detailed knowledge makes it extremely difficult to produce a speculative account of universal history. It is interesting to consider Spengler in this context. Spengler had vigorously combated the idea of universal history, since he even denied the continuity of time, which he replaced with a concept of simultaneity. That is to say, he treated the chron chronological succession of so-called cultures synchronically, thus effectively denying chronological sequence. Spengler is regarded by historical positivists as a wildly speculative metaphysician because he demolished the unity of history by his insistence on the specificities of individual cultures. Nevertheless, because of his denial of historical continuity, we must situate him likewise in the positivist tendency. This places him incidentally in the tradition he stems from, and which goes back via Nietzsche to Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer, too, should be included among the thinkers who, in sharp contrast to what he thought of as the optimistic purveyors of universal history, effectively came around to a denial of history, to a conception of history as no more than the dreary repetition of eternal sameness, or perhaps even as the history of decline. When I say that Spengler's theory of history comes close to positivism, for all his opposition to positivism, in a strange way this nevertheless chimes in with Spengler's own attitude. His own habits of mind were strongly positivistic, and he always gave precedence to the inexorable facts over attitudes, willpower or the idea, or whatever else one is disposed to call it. As long as you do not have too great a knowledge of historical detail, and this is a factor that must for once be included in the philosophical discussion, you not only you not only have the benefit of a greater distance, which enables you to gain a better overview, but by the same token, you are blinder to facts that make things awkward for philosophical theory. In such a situation, one's own intellectual superiority thrives on one's own deficiency, on the fact that one knows too little. It is all very well to try and demonstrate one's inge ingenuity in devising a profound interpretation of history when one has only a passing acquaintance with the details of the case. Philosophically, too, this is an aspect of the dialectic between universal and particular that we should not lose sight of. It provides the justification, the element of truth, 
and the positivists' constant sniping at philosophical interpretations of history. We may say that in general philosophy, and indeed intellect as such, is more naive, and we may even say more infantile than its otherwise inferior positivist adversary. At the same time, it must not sh- it must not allow itself to be persuaded to part with the advantage that lies in this greater distancing, but must instead face up to the task of directing its constructive energies towards the details of history. And it must go on to mobilize the forces required to construct the totality in the details themselves. For if those forces remain unable to engage with the details of history, they are all too likely to remain vapid, vacuous, and lacking in authority. I believe, for example, that Benjamin's historical studies, or indeed my own, if I may be allowed to talk out of school for once and speak of my own efforts, both have their roots in this situation. That is to say, they arise from the wish to hold fast to the speculative element without which, as I have explained in an earlier lecture, historical knowledge that aspires to being more than superficial is hardly possible. On the other hand, both of us strove to immerse ourselves in historical detail in order to avoid that specious mastery that arises from not being too familiar with the facts. Something of this desire can be seen in, in, sorry. Something of this desire can be seen in Benjamin's so-called defense of induction, and also in my own tendency to immerse myself in highly specific individual texts, or other intellectual products, instead of seeking out broader contexts, and then to look for the broader interconnections in those specific texts or products. You too, if you eventually end up in productive work of this sort, will perhaps experience the tension of which I am speaking, and to the philosophical significance of which I am alerting you. I should like to offer you one further illustration of this, in an example taken from Hegel. In this sphere, we find him combining the profoundest insights with a kind of inferiority, an almost childish reluctance to get to grips with the matter in hand. The specious mastery that results from this amounts to what we associate with the term idealism, that the naivete, the schoolmasterly naivete, with which history is judged on block or constructed on block. There is a theory in his philosophy of history, and many of you who are busy preparing yourselves for the so-called philosophicum will already have heard of this theory. It can be found in the lectures on the philosophy of history, that is to say, one of Hegel's supposedly easier books, and it asserts that in the Oriental world, by which he chiefly meant China, only one man was free. In the world of the Greeks, which of course was a slave-owning society, a few men were free, and only in the modern world, or what he rather disastrously calls the Christian Germanic world, is everyone free, potentially at least. It is very easy to demonstrate the arrogance and folly of this thesis. I need only remind you of the simple fact that has long been familiar familiar to us all, that even Oriental societies governed by an extreme form of absolutism never had such a pure, obsolete, single monarch at their head. In reality, they were largely feudal societies, so that they contained no single free person but a class system, admittedly one that was hierarchically organized. But this fact is simply ignored in Hegel's theory, since he plays fast and loose with the facts for the sake of the brilliant symmetry of the argument, which with its logical progression, one, a few, all, was brilliant at least for his age, which had rather more modest aspirations. This cavalier treatment of the facts can also be seen in Balzac, a near contemporary of Hegel's, who sometimes dealt with social reality in a similar fashion. This remarkable attitude of so much the worse for the facts was undoubtedly one of the factors leading to the emergence of positivism. But on the other hand, it contains the power of the imagination, without which the intellectual advances that were so characteristic of the age could not have, could not have been made. But equally, it goes without saying that in the modern world, the idea of the freedom of all has not become literally true. Because in the meantime, the critical analysis of society has demonstrated in countless ways that the formal liberty of all individuals in bourgeois society must be contrasted with their actual unfreedom in reality.
In this sense, it is quite easy for any student of history in his very first term to criticize Hegel's theory. If he is content with this, he can go back home with a massive prejudice against philosophy and without ever feeling the need to come to grips with those windbags. Well, I've been playing the devil's advocate here, but I have to tell you that in reality, the matter is not as simple as all that. You need only to reflect briefly to convince yourselves how much truth is contained in Hegel's seemingly absurd, masterfully absurd theory. As you are aware, the idea of freedom is the cornerstone of Hegel's philosophy of history, since that philosophy understands history as progress in the consciousness of freedom. But the idea of freedom is tied to the individual. Initially, the concept of freedom has its meaning only insofar as we understand by it by it individual freedom, the freedom of the individual to act spontaneously, autonomously on his own responsibility, and to decide for himself. As long as he does not offend against the freedom of others, the freedom of his fellow human beings. This latter doctrine was formulated in exemplary fashion by Kant in his philosophy of right. Thus underlying the doctrine of freedom in whose name Hegel developed that three-stage theory of the development of history is the individual himself. In fact, when he speaks of one, some, and all, this idea of freedom does refer directly to the freedom of individuals, and even the number of individual human beings. If you take Hegel's thesis literally, it leaves itself open to all the objections that I have been almost too embarrassed to explain to you, because they are so commonplace and so obvious. However, if for a moment you look at Hegel's intended meaning in a slightly less literal spirit, from a greater distance and from the standpoint of the individual, you would perceive how much rationality, how much plausibility enters into this seemingly rash idea. And I do not think that one would need to do too much violence to the text to rescue Hegel in this way. In the East, in Oriental society as a whole, the category of the individual, the category of individuation, does not stand at the center in the same way as it does in Western thought. I think that one can say this without exposing oneself to the accusation of colonial Eurocentric impertinence. The difficulties in communication and mutual understanding between East and West are to be found essentially in the fact that we, and I believe that this we, has a scope that includes the most heterogeneous political and philosophical concepts, that we measure all the concepts of the universal, of the not I, by their relation to the I. In contrast, and this extends to the very heart of Oriental beliefs, the tendency in the East is to mitigate the suffering of the individual by identifying him with a totality that he is not, by identifying him with a not I, rather than to judge existing reality against the yardstick of individual individuality. Thus, if you you examine this Hegelian argument from the standpoint of the Principium Individuationis, the assumption that in China there was only one individual because only one person was the emperor does indeed sound nonsensical. However, it is by no means nonsensical to assert that in the Oriental world, the concept of the individual was not of central importance. Hegel may even have been aware in the most recent historical developments seem to have proved him right, that this absence of individuation was itself a historical stage. By this I mean that in order to be able to endure the suffering imposed on him by barbaric rule, the individual simply had no alternative but the unconditional identification with the not I, and ultimately with nothing at all, the void. In contrast, the category of the individual is itself the product of history and only assumed a formative role at a much later stage. In antiquity, and here too, Hegel had a genuine insight, the category of the individual remained a privilege simply because Greek and Roman society owed their reproduction to the slave system, to slavery. Only relatively few people in antiquity, then if anyone at all, had the opportunity to develop into individuals. I should add at once that this is also the reality in our own Western society. There is something hollow and fatuous about telling people who are entirely ruled by the wants and deprivations of everyday life, an elderly cleaning lady, for example, that they should develop their individuality. 
that is not so much humane and universally human as universally cynical in my view. Nevertheless, there is a crucial distinction here. The conditions of formal equality mean that even this famous elderly cleaning lady receives something like a license to be an individual, a right to individuality, however little she is able to avail herself of it and convert it into a reality. In antiquity, in contrast, the idea of such a right did not exist. In this respect, Christianity, with its doctrine of the absolute value of the individual soul as immortal and created in the image of God, did indeed bring about a world historical change of incalculable proportions, and Hegel was right to emphasize this. It can be said that in antiquity, the idea of individuality was essentially privileged. This means that where individuality was able to develop, it was something restricted, particular, one might even say barbaric. This circumstance had a negative effect upon the notion of individuality as something of universal human validity in the middle stoa, particularly in thinkers such as Posidonius and Panadius, turning it into something very pallid and chimerical. On the other hand, there is a period of antiquity in which we can genuinely speak of an individualistic society. This was the entire period following Alexander the Great that we are accustomed to referring to as the Hellenistic Age. During this epoch, individuality did not so much form the substance of society as a kind of incidental accompaniment. For even where it developed, it was more of a private intermezzo, a protected reserve for individuals, than something that determined the inner nature of society, as was true of the new society later on. In this connection, it is no mere chance that one of the most famous Hellenistic maxims for the individual should have been Lede Biosis, in other words, live in obscurity. In other words, wherever individuality emerges, it really remains separate from society, which is more or less left to its own devices. That is to say, the great political poten potentates, first Alexander and the Diodaki, and then the Romans. The consequence is that individuality remains a particular, even where its social impact is concerned. And Jacob Burkhart, who had great sensitivity in matters of this sort, and to whom we owe the deepest insights on such questions, has come up with a very perceptive comment. This is in the Greeks and Greek civilization, that in this so-called individualistic Hellenistic society, the individual became atrophied, thanks to the separation of the individual from the political and social reality. He is speaking only of Greece in the period following Epicurus, that is to say, of the true age of individualism in Greek society. But his conclusion is that in this age, no record of great individuals, whatever that might mean, has come down to us. The concept of the individual becomes radical in the modern world, the bourgeois world, only when the form of the economy, that is to say the way in which the lives of human beings are reproduced, is determined by initiative, by labor, a sense of responsibility, the autonomy of individual human beings standing in a relationship based on exchange. Radical here means that for centuries, right down to the threshold of our own age, the individual has proved to be the figure through which the universal that is, the reproduction of the human world, is mediated. Modern history begins with the discovery of the individual, and this has a quite different pathos, and what may be called a quite different three-dimensionality from the manifestation of individuality in antiquity. We see it in Descartes, for example, or in Montaigne's essays, or in its first truly great expression in Shakespeare. In this sense, we can say that in the history of modern, i.e. bourgeois society, the category, or i.e. bourgeois society, the category of the individual is socialized, in the first instance, so that formally at least it becomes the decisive form of the social process. We need, of course, to make this idea dialectical if we do not wish to talk nonsense. In this instance, because the bourgeois concept of individuality contained the call for its socialization, that is to say, its adaptation to social norms, and because that has been the case ever since the concept of individuality became dominant, it has had its shadow side, namely the crisis of individuality 
Today, when the category of the individual seems to be in complete decline, this crisis has assumed extreme forms. You can see then the value of reading a writer such as Hegel, as I have generally suggested, that is to say, not just with the requisite precision, but also by making certain allowances. If we read him in that way, then even assertions that are as provocative as those I focused on, because they are provocative, turn out to have far more truth and to be far more productive than might appear to a theory that is inclined to throw the baby out with the bathwater and to consign Hegel's entire theory of history to the rubbish heap of obsolete thought simply because of one absurd statement. To this degree, then, theories of universal history do have their validity, as they have tried to show you with the aid of this arbitrarily chosen example of the concept of the individual, although admittedly it is not quite as arbitrary as it may seem, since the individual is a crucial phenomenon of history. After all, we might just as well assert that history is the history of the rise and fall of the individual, as make a similar claim under some other heading. However, the fact that we might make use of a whole series of other definitions, Hegel's idea of freedom or Marx's thesis of the struggle between the forces of production and the relations of production are obvious examples. This fact shows that history is a constellation that can really be grasped only with the help of an elaborate philosophical theory and not by reducing it to individual concepts or pairs of concepts. However, the theory of history as universal history is open to objections of quite a different sort. These objections may be based on theological or socio-critical assumptions, and, can, and you can see them in their most extreme form in the theses on the philosophy of history of Walter Benjamin, to which he gave the title on the concept of history. These come from his very last period and can in a sense be regarded as his testament. They may well be the last text that he completed. You can read about it in our edition of his writings. I would be grateful, in fact, if you all were to do this, if at all possible, so that in my next lecture I can assume that you are familiar with these theses. At all events, I should like to anticipate that by pointing out that the element of consent, of apologia, that is to say the element that justifies history from the standpoint of the victor and defends everything that has happened on the grounds of its necessity, this element of consent is connected with the construction of a theory of universal history because the assumption of such a continuous unity in history seems to point to the idea that history has a positive meaning. In this respect, it resembles the element of, hit of victory, which is proclaimed in the name of the principle that has been the unifying factor in history down to the present day. It would be the task of philosophy to determine whether that unifying factor really is the positive, meaningful principle it appears to be. But let me continue with this discussion next time.